Hello everyone, uh, in this video we're going to be discussing the concept of non-coherent demodulation as well as do some proofs and uh, solve an example problem. Uh, so the concept of non-coherent demodulation is, uh, is a topic that discusses how to do demodula demodulation for amplitude modulated signal if you do not know what the phase of the carrier frequency is. So if you have uh, not seen the uh, coherent demodulation video, I encourage you to have a look at it. It's in the description of, uh, the, of this video and it explains to you why the coherent demodulation does not work if you do not know the phase. Okay. So if you do not know the phase, then you need to do non-coherent demodulation. And in that case, it's going to depend on uh, non-linear circuits as opposed to uh, linear circuits uh, as, as it was the case in coherent uh, demodulation. Sometimes, by the way, it's called asynchronous demodulation. So non-coherent demodulation is sometimes referred to as asynchronous demodulation. So the first thing is uh, using diodes. Uh, using diodes and RC circuits, we can do the non-coherent uh, demodulation. How is that going to happen? Well, if you're given an input signal, and the input signal, you it is amplitude modulated, which means that the amplitude of the carrier frequency is what has the information so we're interested in this in this uh, in this um, signal which is the green one and then in that case what you need to do is pass it by the diode and then pass the signal by the RC circuit and take the output over the capacitor okay so why is this going to happen why is this going to give us the envelope of this um, of this uh, of the signal uh, well because the diode is going to block the negative part of the signal is going to pass only the positive part so the positive cycle only passes and the RC circuit are going to pass only the green um, envelope why is that because the at the very beginning the the uh, the capacitor charges and then discharges slowly it doesn't discharge as quick as the signal drops uh, following the carrier Okay, it charges, it discharges pretty slowly, charges and then discharges, which means that it's going to follow the envelope and it is not going to follow the carrier. Okay, but you need to make sure that the time constant of the discharging is much smaller than the time, the period of the carrier frequency, and that's why uh, it's much larger than the period of the carrier frequency, and that's why RC has to be much larger than one over FC. Okay, and at the same time, you need to make sure that it is uh, that the RC, that the time constant is following the envelope. It's not pretty slow uh, to the extent that it uh, does not follow the the signal that you're interested in decoding and demodulating, and that's why the time constant has to be much less uh, than the than the one over the bandwidth of the signal. Okay? And that's why sometimes we use this uh, formula and sometimes we use the other formula in terms of, in terms of frequency. Okay? okay, so let's take an example on that. Okay? So we're given a diode and we would like to find the value of the resistor and the capacitor. As long as the diode is ideal, then we're fine with that. Then, uh, or close to ideal even because there does not exist any ideal diodes. Uh, then in that case, um, the resistor and the capacitor are what need, we need to find the values of. Okay, and we would like to find the values of these resistor, uh, with this resistor and capacitor, such that it demodulates an amplitude modulated signal, and its carrier frequency is at 500 kilohertz. Okay, and the bandwidth is 4 kilohertz. Okay, so what I need to do is that I need to make sure that one over RC is much less than FC. So here I'm, I'm using the second formula. 1 over RC is much less than FC. Okay, So the FC here, uh, in order to make it much larger than 1 over RC, then I'm going to multiply by um, an one order of magnitude, which is 0.1. So 1 over RC is, as, as long as it is smaller than 1 tenth of the, okay, one -tenth of the carrier frequency, then I'm satisfied with that. Okay, which gives us 50 kilohertz. And at the same time, the same case goes for the second inequality. Okay, as long as 1 over RC is greater than 10 times the bandwidth, then I'm satisfied with that. And then you get this inequality. Okay, 
which if you uh, if you invert it, if you get uh, take the reciprocal of that inequality, you get this RC inequality, and you could choose any value between the 25 microseconds and the 20 microseconds. I chose the middle point, okay? So it doesn't really matter which one to choose, but as long as uh, it's in the middle point, okay? And I chose the R to be one kilo ohm, and the capacitor to be 22.5 nanofarads. Okay. Of course, in practice, you might want to change these values because you might not find a capacitor with exactly 22.5, but that's, uh, these are only uh, design, pro uh, design problems, the design values. You could choose uh, whatever values that, suits, that, has, that are available in front of you in practice. Okay. So let's look at the second way of doing the, the non-coherent demodulation. The second way is, is using a squaring device. So in the squaring device, what we're going to be uh, de depending on is to square the signal that has been fed to the system that we have, we, have, we have received. Okay, if you do the squaring, then you're going to obtain the cosine squared that we already were depending on in the coherent mo um, demodulation. And uh, we're going to obtain this value just by squaring without multiplication by the cosine or without even the knowing the, the phase as we uh, as it is was the case in the coherent demodulation okay so uh, then you do then you do the squaring and then you pass it by a lupus filter why because the squaring is going to result in a in a value at centered at the zero okay multiplied by one centered at zero hertz and a value centered at tw double the angle Okay, and I encourage you to look at the coherent demodulation video if you haven't uh, yet, because it explains these in uh, in plotting. Okay, pass it by a low pass filter, you get this term, and then you could easily take the square root, which is basic, which gives you the required signal x of t. Of course, up to a scaling factor, and this is totally accepted. Okay, you just that's an, a gain, and you can multiply by that gain. Okay. Similarly, you can depend on another uh, way of doing the uh, of doing this non-coherent demodulation. You, I'm going. Not, I'm not going to depend on squaring the uh, the signal directly, but I'm going to pass it first by a cosine, and at the same time, I'm going to pass it by a sine. And in that case, it doesn't have to be uh, it doesn't have to be the same with the same phase as the uh, as the signal as the carrier frequency. Okay, so even if you do not know what the value of theta c is, you could still choose any value of theta. Okay, as long as it is, uh, as this uh, theta is equal to that theta. Okay, which can be easily done uh, using local oscillators. So you take the first value, you, you take the, uh, you take a branch of the signal, multiply it by a cosine, and take another branch, multiply it by a sine. And the first branch, you're going to pass it by a Lopez filter. And then pass it by pass the output by a squaring device, okay. And you do the same thing for the for the sine, and then you get you end up having two terms. So you, if you add these two terms and take the square root, then you're going to get y of t, okay. So these are actually the steps. You do the multiplication by the cosine and the sine, and then you pass it by Lopez filter, and then square each term separately. Okay, remember that I squared this one and squared that one separately. And then after that, I add the two terms. If I added the two terms, I'm going to end up having the square of that, okay? Which if you take the, the square root, you're going, to, you're going to get a scaling factor of the signal that you are looking for, right? So the, this proof, you can write it down um, pretty much easily, and uh, it's going to follow the same steps as the uh, the second type, but perhaps a little bit more steps. You're going, you need to do it twice: once for the cosine, once for the sine. And you're going to depend on some identities, one of more, one or more of these identities. Okay, and that's why I have listed down listed them for you down here. Okay, cosine multiplied by cosine. Remember that it is equal to half cosine. Cosine, but here there is a multi, an, an addition or a subtraction. I'm going to tell you in a moment whether it's an addition or a subtraction. Okay, and if it's a sine, then you get the same thing as well. If it's sine multiplied by cosine, you get the same thing as well. And the difference is in the whether it's an addition or subtraction, and whether this is addition or subtraction. 
Okay, so always the beginning, the very the first one is subtraction, subtraction, subtraction. Okay, and this is addition, addition, addition. Okay, so that's common among them all. Right, that's the way that we uh, memorize them. Okay, in case you do not have a cheat sheet on your uh, final exam, that's the way that we memorize them. Okay, so if you have a cosine and you get you got cosine. Then in that case, it's going to be plus. Okay. Why did I write here cosine? Just because these two are cosines. These two are similar. When they're similar, you write cosine. When they're different, you write sines. Okay. When it is cosine and cosine, you write plus. When it is sine and then you got a cosine, you write down minus. Okay. And remember, that's why the first one has to be minus and the second one is a plus. And the negative is multiplied by the cosine that has the, the addition of the two angles, A and B, okay? And then when you have a sine, and this is a sine, so that's a plus, okay? What if you have a cosine multiplied, cosine X, for instance, multiplied by cosine Y, then do not, multiplied by sine Y. Then in that case, do not follow this, this rule, just change them to a sine multiplied by cosine. So, uh, so change their position. Okay, sine y multiplied by cosine x. Okay, and then you can apply this formula directly. And you might use this as well, which is the cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. Or you might use these uh, and these um, formulas as well. If you have cosine a plus b, then it is cosine cosine minus sine sine. And if it's sine a plus b, then sine cosine plus cosine sine. And when we were kids, we used to, they used to teach us to memorize them that the cosine gives us ku ku sen sen. And if it's a sine, it gives us si ku ku sa. Okay? That's basically the way that we used to memorize them. The final thing that I would like to leave you guys with is uh, that all of these steps uh, are valid because we were assuming that x of t was above the zero. Okay? It was always positive. If it's not positive, then you're not going to be able to depend on the squaring devices because it's going to cancel the negative and it's going to make it uh, positive. And that's why it needs to be shifted first before you do the transmission, not after you do the transmission. And remember that that condition was actually a condition for the amplitude modulated signal in the first place. So you will never ever receive a modulated signal x of t multiplied by cosine except if the x of t was already shifted above the zero level. Okay, so that's an, uh, so that's an important pro uh, point uh, so that you guys know, uh, because you might be questioning, yeah, how am I going to square it and then take the square root and then get the same value as well? Well, it's the same value because it is a positive value. Okay, so this condition, you need to note that. Okay. Uh, remember that the notes of this video is posted in the description and uh, make sure to share this video if you found it useful. Uh, most likely other people need it as well. Thanks for your attention.